If you'd go ahead and uh, uh, turn to Genesis chapter number 1, although technically we're not getting into our verse-by-verse study quite yet because we're still looking at a bit of an overview of the book of Genesis, I I am just, uh, the book of Genesis just, uh, I I don't know the right adjective to use, Uh, you know, excite to, to the fact, to say that Genesis excites me is an understatement. I mean, Genesis is just a fabulous book. There is so much going on in Genesis that, that, um, that you know, you, you read the book of Chronicles and you see Israel's history, and, uh, you know, not a whole lot of that is applicable to you today, you know, about what the, the history of, of the nation of Israel. There's things for you to learn. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to, to devalue the Word of God. But when you come to the book of Gen- Genesis and you see what's going on at the very beginning, that relates to every, you turn on your news programming tonight and I guarantee you, you'll see something that links towards the foundations of Genesis. I guarantee it. Um, the, pro- the question is, do we have the wisdom to see it and to see what's going on around us? All right. So I just wanted to, I wanted to make some broad comments. Again, I was hoping to use the PowerPoint to give you kind of like some tables and some overview so that way you can visually see it. But since you can't visually see it, you'll have to use your imaginations, and I'll just try to bring it to life. Oh, who am I kidding? I can't bring it to life. But, but you'll just have to use your imagination, okay? Um, so the outline of the book of Genesis that I think you hold in your hand there at the bottom of the page is when I look at Genesis, I think that there's a, a, a certain breakdown there where uh, it, I, I think you can break down the first 11 chapters into four main areas. First of all, there's basically the creation. There's the creation of all things. There's the creation of man in the first two chapters. The next three chapters deal with the corruption of man. You know about the fall in the garden and then the result of sin, right? And then you find that, oh man, every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. You see, you know, what happens with Cain and Abel and, and sin lying at the door with Cain. And uh, so you, you see the corruption of man going on. And then you see God responding to the wickedness of man in the earth and he brings destruction on man through the flood. And then he gives the sign of the bow in the sky that he would never do it again. Uh, he would never pour out his wrath in that way again. And so what do those people who are prideful today do? They, they, they commandeer the, the rainbow, uh, which it, the, the audacity of using the very symbol that God said, I will not pour out my judgment and my wrath upon wickedness. And they turn around and say, look at how proud we are about our wickedness. And God isn't going to pour out his judgment. And they, and he, and they hold the rainbow up to God. I om- you know, <laughs> look, this is spiritual warfare. Let's not kid ourselves, right? Uh, it's not like somehow man randomly decided we're going to use uh, a rainbow. I mean, what, what person in their right mind would use a rainbow to represent their sin? But what they're doing, I, I think that this is Satan like thumbing his nose at God and saying, look at how wicked they are, and you said you wouldn't do anything about it. You know. So you got the destruction of man in chapters 6 through 9, and then in chapters 10 through 11, when God wants them to disperse, man says, nope, we're not going to do it your way. They come together, and God comes down and disperses them and confounds their language. So again, that's creation, corruption, destruction, dispersion. And that's how kind of you you have the first uh, chapters of your Bible. So there's 11 chapters up front, and then there's chapters 12 through 50 that deal when God starts dealing with a nation. And this is, look, if you really want to understand kind of a big picture of Genesis from a, from a dispensational standpoint, and that just means how God is dealing with man, you need to understand that in Genesis chapter number 12 and 13, he starts dealing with one man, Abram, who becomes Abraham. And the reason for that is because that wickedness shows back up in the earth. And how is God going to bless the earth with all this wickedness going on? He calls Abram out of a wicked country and says, I'm going to show you a land that's going to be yours. Get up, Abram. And what does Abram do? He gets up and he follows God. The absurdity of that. The word of the Lord came unto Abram and said, get thee up and go into a country I'll show you. (laughs) Now, if your son got up the next day, if, if, if Ethan got up the next day and said, Dad, I'm packing my bags. The word of the Lord came unto me, said he's going to show me a nation that, that I've never seen before, but I'm trusting him and I'm going. And you know what? That pleased God. The faith of Abram pleased God. And so the, uh, what you have in, in Genesis chapter 12 through 50 is God working with a man 
that becomes the, the seed line that becomes the nation. It's God working with the man who becomes the nation, who becomes the chosen nation that God works through, through the whole rest of the Old Testament, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the beginning part of Acts, that it was God's plan for Israel to be the blessing to the whole world. Now, that's, that's what we're getting to, into in Genesis. And so, it's interesting, you know, you have the, the first four events in the first 11 chapters, and in chapters 12 through 50 are really centered around four people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, right? So you have Abraham, and then you have the, the, the promised seed, who is Isaac. And then from Isaac, you have Jacob, who becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's 12 sons, and one of those sons is who? Joseph. And the story ends with, uh, with Joseph. So the, the first 11 chapters cover about 2,000 years, and then chapters 12 through 50 cover 350 years. So what is God's emphasis on in the book of Genesis? Israel. Now, I want you to understand from the outset that we're trying, to, we are not doing a verse by verse study through the book of Genesis. If that's what you thought this is, we're not going to be, if I did a verse by verse study through the book of Genesis, we'd be here for how many, how many years, Kathy? Several, Several years, Several. that's right. That, that's right. Thank, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> she said we never did get through. <laughs> um, but what we're doing is uh, we are trying to stick to an outline by Grace School of the Bible and to move through, the, uh, through that outline. And one of the important books in your Bible to cover is the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, the book of Daniel, the book of Matthew, the book of Acts, the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians. Okay, so these are all very foundational books that have important doctrine when God is, is changing something, okay? Um, and so we're covering, we're, we're studying the book of Genesis and the plan is to spend, let's say around uh, 30, 30 lessons on the book of Genesis. We're not going to get through God's history with Israel. We're not going to be going through that. What you need to understand is what God's doing off the, off the bat here in the beginning, and you need to understand how God starts to work with Abra Abraham and why he's doing that. And if you understand that purpose, then you'll do well enough to know that when you come over to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why it is that they're tracing the seed line of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ back through Israel. You'll know why. Because God promised and said he promised a seed that was going to come through Eve, and that then goes through Noah, that then goes through Shem, and then that goes over into Abram, and God choose, chooses Abram to work through him to bring about the promised seed, which is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole book is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the book of Genesis is going to set us up with that knowledge, okay? All right, so there's four great events, the creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, four great people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The, the history of Genesis is connected by relatively few men. From Adam to Noah, there was Methuselah. And then from Noah to Abraham, there was Shem. And then from Abraham to Joseph, there was Isaac. So there is from Adam to Joseph, it's connected by relatively few men. You have Adam to, to Noah, connected by Methuselah, Noah to Abraham, connected by Shem, and Abraham to Joseph, connected by Isaac. And so you cover the span of how many years? About 2,500 years by going through not very many generations. Um, and so it's, why do I say that? It's an interesting thought to think that how long did Adam live and the things that he communicated unto his seed and then the things that Ab Abraham committed unto, uh, uh, communicated unto his seed. We, we enjoy getting wisdom from the, from, the, from, the, from the elders that are among us. Well, think, I mean, their elders were really elders, right? I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I feel like I don't know a whole lot. And I don't feel like, you know, I'm very particularly qualified to stand up here most of the time. And, and that when you have the, 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 the issue of, of elders, I feel like, you know, when we get to be 60 or 70 years old, I still feel like we're babes really down here on this earth. 
that we don't know a whole lot. <laughs> well, Methuselah had, what, 900 and some years. Now, don't get me wrong, I still think that there's a lot of learning that can be done after 900 and some years, but I would have sure liked, a, you know, 100 years to get my feet wet down here before I started getting up here and having, can you imagine having, getting the opportunity to have 100 years to get into this book and understand it before you start preaching? Well, if I would have waited till I'm 80, then, or, then I would have been dead um, uh, because I'm not going to live that long. I just know it. <laughs> Anyways, my point being is that these, these people live very long, and you think about the, the wisdom and the advice that they were able to pass down to their children. and their, We think about children and grandchildren. I mean, they were thinking about great, 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 great grandchildren, right? So, all right. Um, uh, in the first four sections, I, 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 I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this as well. Uh, in the first four sections, there are the divine, uh, the divine institutions that are set up by God. And this was one of the, the, the most helpful things that I learned from uh, Richard when he was teaching through Grace School of the Bible, is the understanding of the, the divine institutions that God set up from the very beginning. And so the four divine institutions are volition, and volition is the issue of the will. How that every individual is accountable for themselves. When you stand before the judgment, when you, when you stand before God, you're not going to stand before God for the, for the sins of David. David's going to have to stand and, and attest to himself. Why? Because David has his own will. And David has made his own choices in his life. And just like David has to answer for his life, I have to answer for mine, and every person will answer for theirs. And hopefully we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ. That's for all of those who are in Christ and are saved. And we're not standing before the great white throne judgment and those, those are the ones who, have, uh, who down through the ages have not trusted, have not put their faith in God, and will stand there in judgment. But my point being is that volition, you have personal accountability and responsibility. Isn't that missing in our society today? A total, complete lack of responsibility and accountability. And if we would just understand the way that God had designed it, that'd be different. Okay, the issue of then marriage. Marriage is the, the man and the woman becoming one flesh the two becoming one, and that's the basis for the societal construct, right? Uh, you have a marriage, the two becoming one, and it creates a stable unit. Um, and then not only that, but what does God tell man? He says that they are to leave their father and their mother, and the two shall be one. You know, so it, it, it doesn't stay one, one unit, and you bring other people into the one unit. The husband and wife become one, they have children, they raise them up in the Lord, and then children get married, and then they become a unit. And so there's a protection there that comes down through God, through the husband. Um, that, now, the, 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 the second uh, or the third uh, item is the, the, the family. And so the third divine institution is after you have a marriage, and God says, be fruitful and multiply, what does a marriage produce? Children. And then you have a family. And then within the family unit, that's the, again, it's part of the building block of society. Um, uh, when you have a, a person being accountable for himself to act and conduct himself in a godly way, married to a, a, a spouse, you know, you look at a man who is, a, who is uh, responsible for a family, who has a wife and, 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 and children to take care of, that'll do a lot to spurn, to, to spurn you on. I was pretty immature when I graduated high school, and then I met Amanda, and I realized I really love her, and I'd really like to marry her. And if I marry her, we might have kids. I'm going to have to do something with that, that, that I can make some money because I need to find some competent skills. And the, the only thing that I was good at in high school was, you know, playing sports and playing video games, and neither one of those I was going to make a living in, right? I wasn't good enough to to play sports, but the, the, the issue of the responsibility spurned me on to do what I ought to do, if that makes sense. And so in society today, we have the deconstruction of the family. And what the, what the, what the humanist message have been for so long is that, well, it's the village that raises the child, right? It's the village, that, and, the, and, and it takes a village to raise a child. No, no, it takes a family. It takes a mother and a father to raise a child. They have responsibility. A village doesn't have responsibility for one another. If you want to, I know I'm getting a bit off topic, but that's fine. 
You want to look at when this country was founded. They came over and they founded the colonies and they set up a, a socialist construct where everyone would share in the goods. Uh, and, and how did that work out for the people? Do you understand what I'm saying? When they farmed the land, instead of being able to keep what you made on your own farm, they set it up as a commune, as a socialist construct where everybody brought the grain to the main silo and they all shared. Well, how did that work out for them? I'll tell you how it worked out. They all starved. Why? Because men at their heart are lazy. And if I don't have to be accountable for myself and I think my neighbor is going to do the work for me and I can freeload off of him and eat off of his plate, then why should I work? But you know what happened when the moment that they changed the construct and they said you get to keep what you made on your own farm? Not only did the men go back to work, but also the women that were in the house, they also went outside and started planting the little garden and all of a sudden everything flourished and bloomed. Why? Because there's an issue of accountability that we should have within a family construct. Okay, and when society wants to build that, tear that down and say, oh, don't worry, you don't have to be responsible for having children outside of wedlock. We'll just write you a check and take care of them. You don't have to worry about any of that. What does that promote? That, does, that promotes irresponsibility. And in the end, it winds up being destructive, not only for the individual, but also for the community. And so misguided love is actually hate because you don't love people enough to do the right thing. And I'm talking about the government. I'm not talking about individuals there. In that, in that. So it, it's interesting to me that if you want to look at, I'm not even trying to be po political. I'm just trying to say what are the biblical principles that outflow from a, from a godly way of thinking. The, the third divine institution is family. The fourth divine institution is nationalism. Oh boy, tear the, tear the borders down. Multinationalism, let's all just live together, you know. Well, that's not the way that God made it. He defined their, he confused their languages, divided them up, and he defined, de defined the bounds of their habitation. God set up the nations. Why did God set up the nations? Maybe you think, well, why would God do that? Why didn't he just have everybody as one? Well, you go over and read the book of Acts, and you find out the reason that God do that, did that is so that men might seek after God. So you have accountability from God that comes down through the nation. Romans chapter, uh, Romans uh, 13, uh, and, and um, the, the issue of, of the government and, and, and the authority that flows down from God. You have a, a man who has authority over the, the wife and the, and, and the family. What do I, when I say authority, it's, it's, it's the responsibility. It's the responsibility. Um, but boy, we... <laughs> You look at every single one of those, all four of those, and they're just all crumbling. So those are the four divine institutions, volition, marriage, family, and nationalism. Um, I wrote a note here that, that I said that existence or being is based on volition, right? You wouldn't exist if you didn't have volition. Rocks exist, but they don't have volition, so they're a rock. They're not a human being. You ever thought about that second word, human being? You exist. It's the, it's the state of being. You are something, and you have a volition. So uh, uh, existence or being is based on volition. Marriage is based on volition. Love must be freely given. So marriage is based on volition. Family is based on marriage. Uh, you know, homosexuals are not a family. Family is based on on, on marriage. Uh, Sesame Street puts people together and they say family, family is just people who love one another. Uh, and, and anybody can be family. Man and man, woman and woman, man and dog, woman and cat, I don't know. You know, we're just families doing the family thing. That's the, the song that the Sesame Street will, will sing to the children. But family is based on marriage. Marriage is based on it being a man and a woman. And then nationalism is based on families. You know, nations, nations being next to each other is, is not much different than families being next to each other, right? Your family lives uh, uh, and my family live right next door to each other, and we have to manage those neighborly relations, right? And then you have nations that are next door to each other, and nations need to manage those relations. Um, all right. So our purpose in Genesis is to, to study these divine institutions and see the way that God is working with man and, and there through Abraham. And when you come over to Paul's epistles, you know, as, as we're, we're doing this and, 
and what Grace School, the Bible, was founded on and, and, and why we're picking up on this and using it as the basis for our purpose is to understand the revelation of the mystery committed unto Paul and to have a, a, um, a what's the word I'm looking for, uh, a mature uh, approach to life and an understanding of what God is doing. And if you want to understand what God is doing, these are the foundations. And Paul assumes that you understand these things, uh, when these divine institutions, when you get over to his epistles and he starts talking about things. He assumes that people know what marriage is <laughs> and what a family is. Oh, if Paul was around today. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, there is uh, the, some of the first in Genesis is... Genesis contains the creation of the world, its first inhabitants, innocence, the fall of man, the rise of religion, the invention of arts, a universal flood, the repopulating of the earth, the division of the earth, the origin of the nations, kingdoms, and the origin of Israel. So there's a lot of firsts in the, in, in the, book, of, in the book of Genesis. When you look at the definition of Genesis, if you go over to Genesis chapter number 1, perhaps you're already there, and you look at verse number 1, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. And the, the word Genesis means origin or beginning of something. And so the scripture says, in the beginning, and that's where the, the word Genesis comes from. That's why we call it the book of Genesis. It is the beginning. It's not only that Genesis is the beginning of all things, but it's the beginning of all things but God. Because uh, God doesn't have a beginning. Uh, but that's where the title comes from. Now its author is Moses. If you go over to Acts chapter number 7, you don't have to. Uh, perhaps you go to, why don't you go to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter number 24. But in Acts chapter number 7, we learn it, uh, where it says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Acts chapter 7 tells you that Moses was brought up how was Moses brought up? Anybody ever watched the, the, the Ten Commandments? It's what, like a six-hour movie? Have any, of you, have, have any of you seen the Ten Commandments? And so, and, and so Moses is brought up in Pharaoh's house, right? And so he's, uh, he's trained in the ways of the Egyptians. And Acts 7 says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. What was the center of wisdom in those days? Egypt, that was the center of all things, right? So Moses was, was, was trained in the wisdom of the Egyptians. He, was, he had the best of the best. He had the best education available to him. And so he was mighty in words and deeds. Um, so it should, be, it should be no surprise that Moses is here writing the first five books uh, of the Bible. Not that, uh, not that God needed Moses' learning to speak through him and get the books written, uh, but God uses the individuals that, that, he, uh, that he chooses to write the, scripture, the scriptures. So I, what I'd like to do and try to accomplish before we end tonight is establish the fact with you that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter number 24 because I want to assert to you that Moses wrote the book of Exodus. Now, the first five books of the Bible are sometimes called the law or it's called the Pentateuch. Uh, the word Pentateuch Penta means five, and book means books. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, you know, it's spelled what, B-E-U-C-H, Pentateuch, uh, T-E-U-C-H. So uh, it's five books. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books of the Bible written by Moses. Book of Exodus, Exodus chapter number 24, if you're there, look at verse number three. Exodus 24, three, it says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the, under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. What did Moses do with the words of the Lord? He wrote them. He wrote them down. You could also go... Um, to Exodus chapter 34, verse 27 and 28. You can go to Exodus chapter 17, verses 13 and 14. In Exodus chapter 17, it says this. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. God actually told Moses, Write it in a book. 
Now, and, and we have it recorded for us in Scripture that that's what God told Moses. That's in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. Go over to Numbers chapter 33. So uh, Exodus is, is clearly written by Moses. In Numbers chapter 33, we find Moses wrote this as well. Numbers 33, look at verse number 1. These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord, and these are their journeys. <laughs> so the scripture says that Moses wrote their journeys, and these are their journeys. And then they go on, and, and you can read about their journeys in Numbers 33. So who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. Uh, now, go over to Romans chapter number 10, because we're going to establish from the book of Romans that Paul wrote Leviticus and Deuteronomy. We're going to establish from Paul's epistles that Paul says that Moses wrote <laughs> Numbers and, or Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Thank you. So Paul, we're going to find out here in Romans 10 that Paul said that Moses wrote Leviticus. Look at verse number 5. It says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. And if you're so inclined to writing your Bible, or perhaps your Bible has the cross-references there, that's coming from Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And so Paul is saying that Moses, he's quoting Leviticus and saying Moses wrote it. He's the one who described it. Now, interestingly enough, go down uh, to verse number 19. You're still in Romans 10. We're going to find out that Moses wrote another book back there. Romans 10, 19, it says, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will... So who's saying this? Moses. I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. That was said in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 21. Um, there's also a passage, I'll read it for you, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 9, where Paul says, For it is written in the law of Moses... Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? And that, there's a reference there to Deuteronomy 25. So twice, once in Romans 10 and once in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is attesting to the fact that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. In Mark chapter number 10, go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 2. Mark 10, 2. I want you to see that the Lord Jesus Christ also comes in and, and verifies the authorship of the books. In Mark chapter 10 and verse number 2, it says, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. So the suffer the bill of divorcement is found in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse number 1. So the Lord Jesus Christ knew that, that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ know it, but when he said, What did Moses command you? Those people who were challenging Christ also knew what Moses wrote to them because they said, Oh, Moses said to suffer uh, us to write a bill of divorcement. So look, there's, there shouldn't be much debate on who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and, De and Deuteronomy. But when you get into the circles of Christian scholarship, you know, and people come along and say, well, there's multiple writers, it's not just Moses. Um, so, and, or they deny the authorship being Moses. That's, that's why we, we, we deal with this, because you may think that it's common because you're a Bible believer, and you'll take what the Bible says on a certain, if you're like me, you'll take what the Bible says, and I'll trust that, rather than some, you know, German high scholar over there who's uh, in the late 1800s who's uh, coming up with some theory as to, uh, well, if someone describes Je God with Jehovah rather than 
than, than this word over here, then, then, then it's a different writer. But people will look for all kinds of ways to try to bring about their wisdom. Um, in the book of Chronicles, uh, Deuteronomy is called the, books, uh, the, the, the book of Moses. So uh, Chronicles attests to Deuteronomy being the book of Moses as well. And then why don't we close tonight by looking at Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 44 says this, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So the Lord Jesus Christ here provides the overview of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And the law is the first five books of the Old Testament. And what does he say there? He doesn't just say law, prophets, and Psalms. He says law of Moses. So the Lord Jesus Christ specifies that the law was written by Moses. So that law contains the first five books. And by the way, your English Bible is laid out differently than the Hebrew Bible there. Because uh, the Hebrew Bible is laid out there with the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. But your English Bible is laid out with the law, and then you basically have the writings in the middle, and then you have uh, the prophets at the end. Now, there's a reason for that, but that's not our topic of conversation tonight. Maybe I'll just tingle your ears and, and cause you to think about that a little bit more and maybe lie awake at night and say, what in the world is the answer to that question? Why would that be? All right, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are truly thankful for your love towards us, that you loved us enough to send your Son to die for all of our sins. And because of that, we want to know you better. And because of that, we're encouraged to love one another as you loved us. And so we gather together with like-minded believers to love one another and also to learn more about you. Uh, because not only that we desire to, but that we know that your will is that we might be edified by your word to be better used of you, to be vessels in this world, to see souls saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's towards this end that we come together and gather to do your will here on this earth until our time comes. In Christ's name we pray, amen.